Welcome to the final conceptual lecture on additional aspects of aqueous equilibria. Continuing this very long lecture series, I'm going to teach you how common ions can affect solubility. Are you ready? Let's get started. Now, I want you to imagine that we had the following hypothetical reaction. Calcium fluoride solid dissociating in an equilibrium way with its respective ions, calcium cation and fluorine anion. Now, if you had this reaction going on, I want you to then imagine that we suddenly started adding barium fluoride, which is a compound that dissolves to form more F minus. What do you think would happen? Well, you might imagine that barium fluoride would, of course, dissociate and form a bunch more F minus and increase the concentration of F minus here to the right. What would that do to the equilibrium? Well, that's right. By Le Chatelier's principle, it would shift it to the left. So whenever we have a solid salt, such as this calcium fluoride here, in equilibrium with its dissolved ions, the calcium 2 plus and F minus over here in solution, and we then add a strong electrolyte, in this case barium fluoride, that produces more of those ions, the F minus, then the equilibrium reaction will be driven to the left. This is analogous to the common ion effect. In fact, it's exactly like the common ion effect that I taught you in an earlier video, except it's for salts instead of acids and bases. Let's take a look then at this example. At STP, the KSP for the dissolution of calcium fluoride is equal to this number. Calculate the solubility of calcium fluoride at 25C in a solution that is both 0.01 molar in calcium nitrate and 0.01 molar in sodium fluoride. Now, if you want, you can attempt this on your own. And then, per usual, you can click this link if you like to watch me show you how to do it on the board. OK, there's one more detail that I want to mention. If the concentration of added ions gets larger than what you would calculate for KSP, then the solid will actually begin to precipitate. For example, here, for instance, where we've got calcium fluoride dissociating into calcium and fluoride ions, we know that the KSP equals 3.9 times 10 to the negative 11th. So if the concentration of calcium cation or fluoride anion gets high enough to cause the product of these terms to be larger than 3.9 times 10 to the negative 11th, then calcium fluoride will begin to precipitate or solidify out of solution. Our text says it in this way. If we have an equilibrium, such as this one, and we add a bunch of reactant and or products, then we can calculate its non-equilibrium solubility constant, called a reaction quotient, or a Q, as being this. So once again, the idea behind Q is that if we have amounts of reactants and products in this equilibrium setting, we throw them into this, we can determine whether or not we will have precipitation. So if Q happens to equal KSP, then your reactants won't precipitate because you're right at that magic sweet spot. If Q is larger than KSP, then there are too many products and the equilibrium will drift to the left, which means that you will see your reactant precipitate out. Now, if Q is less than KSP, then there's too much reactant and it will continue to dissolve until you add enough uh, product or reactant to make Q reach KSP. You might remember something like this from chapter 15. Does that make sense? All right, let's go and do some problems. First, a solution of sodium fluoride is added dropwise to a solution that is 0 0.0144 molar in barium cation. When the concentration of fluoride exceeds blank molar, barium fluoride will precipitate. Please neglect volume changes. For barium fluoride, just so you know, KSP is equal to this number. As per usual, you're welcome to attempt this on your own. And then if you like, you can click this link to a separate video in which I show you how to do it on the board. All right. Now let's suppose we have an equilibrium reaction in which a solid dissolves to make either hydroxide or H+. For example, consider this one, where we've got magnesium hydroxide in an equilibrium setting to yield magnesium cation and hydroxide anion. Now just so you know, at STP, a standard solution of magnesium hydroxide has a pH of 10.52. Now imagine if we added another electrolyte to the solution that dissolved to give off more magnesium 2+. For example, what would happen if we threw in a bunch of magnesium chloride? So I want you to think about this question. How would adding magnesium chloride shift the equilibrium of this reaction up here? And then how would it affect the solution's pH? Once again, magnesium chloride would dissipate to give a bunch of Mg2+, magnesium cation. That would feed back into this reaction and drive the reaction to the left. 
Now, in order to drive it to the left, what has to happen? Well, the hydroxide also has to recombine with the magnesium 2 plus. So that decreases the amount of hydroxide that you have floating freely in solution. And what does that do to the pH? It makes the pH less basic. All right, let's take a look at a problem. What is the minimum molar concentration of nickel cation required to begin precipitating nickel hydroxide from a solution with a pH of 8.7? The KSP of nickel hydroxide, just so you know, is this number. As I usually do, you're welcome to attempt this on your own. And then if you like, you can click the link here. It's a separate video in which I show you how to do it on the board. All right, let's go on. Now, you might remember us talking earlier about Le Chatelier's principle back in chapter 15. Le Chatelier's principle, in a nutshell, states that if a system at equilibrium is dis if a system at equilibrium is disturbed, it will shift in whichever direction it has to, either right or left, to help restore equilibrium. Now, I want you to keep this in mind as we visit the next and final problems from this chapter. First, if ammonia is placed into an otherwise empty sealed container at 400 C, what would you expect to find after the system has reached equilibrium? As per usual, I want you to think about this on your own, and then if you like, click the link here to a separate video in which I explain it on the board. And lastly, if hydrogen gas were added to the system shown here at equilibrium, how would the concentration of iodine gas change as equilibrium is reestablished? Once again, I want you to think about this on your own, and then if you like, you can click the link here to a separate video in which I show you how to do it on the board. That takes us to the end of this video and the end of this chapter. Please stay tuned to our next and upcoming videos in which I will teach you about magic. Okay, I'm not really going to be teaching you about that. Anyway, until next time, have an enjoyable rest of your day.